In today's environment, I'm afraid, our society's best values, such as mutual respect, collaboration, equity, and reciprocity, are sometimes in disfavor. They seem to be regarded by some people as dispensable, fuzzy-headed, naive, too much trouble, and not able to produce effective outcomes. Quite to the contrary, I, I started thinking about this, about my personal experiences in solving difficult problems. And quite to the contrary, in my own experience, making choices that represent a strong ethical stance is not just right, but in the long term, approaches that are inclusive and based on values like empathy, respect, reciprocity, and collaboration make good business, good policy, good strategy, and lead to the most successful outcomes. In case you haven't guessed, I am a card-carrying Democrat. Um, but I think we lost contact with our base. And so I think we need to understand more what is going on and have respectful uh, relationships uh, with those we disagree with. We've got to get past this I'm right and you're wrong American conversation. Every conversation in America now, I don't care, left, right, or center, has become simply, I'm right, you're wrong. I'm right, you're wrong. Or worse, we're right, they're wrong. We're not even talking to each other, we're talking about each other. That conversation, listen, sometimes it's true, but you've got to have that conversation alongside another conversation that simply says, I want to understand you, and I really want you to understand me. Whether we ever agree or not, I just need to understand, why do you think that way? What's happened in your life where you feel that way? Well, let me tell you about my life. Where's that conversation gone? When you have that conversation, even when you vote against each other, and we're gonna vote against each other, that's why we get to vote. You get to vote against people. Even when you vote against somebody, you don't have to hate them. You understand where they're coming from, even when you disagree. Now it's like, I can't understand how these people could think. Folks, I'm, I've been African-American almost my entire life. <laughs> it's true. For about six months, I was really into you two. Other than that, I've been black the whole time. No offense, Bono, but <laughs> When somebody says, these people, those people, you people, they are dehumanizing you. And listen to how we're talking. You say, well, they do it to us. Yes, third grader, it is true <laughs> that sometimes the other kids are mean, but we're talking about your choices. Okay, and we're literally at that level of conversation now with the adults. I don't care what they do, I'm talking about us right now. And Dr. King said, no matter what somebody does, you never pull them so low that you hate them, that you disrespect them. The norms of political dialogue have become so much more vitriolic and so much angrier and so much nastier. And when you move beyond tone, of course, the substance and the ability to come to, common al to, com to, 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 to an agreement with someone who's just called you horrible, angry, nasty things is by human nature a more difficult thing to do. You know, I, I, again, I tell my students, I tell them about Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill working together mm -hmm. to save social, social security. I can tell them about Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich mm -hmm. working together, mm -hmm. and I may be telling them, might as well be telling them, Gloria, about the butter churn and the eight-track tape player. <laughs> they know these things once existed, right? but just have no relevance in their daily lives. And so it, it seems to me for the Commonwealth Club, how do, you, how do you lower the volume? Because while that doesn't automatically lead to substantive agreement, it makes it more possible when you're talking respectfully with someone with whom you disagree, rather than screaming and yelling and throwing things. I think the biggest threat to America is tribalism. 
Uh, I think that tribalism has broken out on the left and the right. People don't seem to care about the truth anymore. They seem to care about whether it helps my side or helps your side. Uh, and that is really, really dangerous because then we can no longer have a conversation. If we can't agree on a common basis of fact, we can't have a conversation in the first place. If you're just going to assume that I'm evil on the basis of my political perspective, then we can't have a conversation. And I'm seeing it both on the right and the left, which is troubling to me because I always thought that this was sort of a, uh, a, an endemic to the left. I didn't think it was endemic to the right. Uh, I think that Obama has sort of trolled the right into oblivion and the right now has become reactionary in response. And so it's, okay, so Trump said something that's not true, but he really screwed with the left's head, didn't he? And so, well, so what? I mean, that's not hard. It's the easiest thing in the world is to screw with the left's head. I mean, and that's, that's really not difficult. Uh, and on the left, the same sort of thing. You'll see the left say that Trump has proposed a Muslim ban. No, he didn't propose a Muslim ban. On the right, you'll see that people say Trump has, Trump has proposed, uh, tr Trump actually had a bigger inauguration crowd size than, than Obama, right? A plurality of Republicans believed that by polls. That's silly. Okay, it's not true. And just because you like Trump doesn't make it true. And th this, this basic philosophy, I think, is really dangerous for, for the republic as a whole. If you want to have the conversation, here's what I've learned. Mm -hmm. When we argue, or when we sense an argument, the rational thinking, persuasion, uh, thoughtful parts of the brain in the front here, they shut down. And the fight or flight part, the little lizard brain, turns on. And when that happens, you pick a side. And your uncle's gonna pick his side. It's always your uncle. Your uncle's gonna pick his side, and you're gonna pick your side, and that's that. And it's over. You're now just rah, 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 rah. How does hyperpartisanship and polarization in American politics affect our society, and maybe most importantly, our ability to make good policy decisions? Uh, well, it's awful. Uh, it makes it almost impossible. Uh, one of my dearest friends from my years in Washington uh, was and still is a Republican. Uh, he was then uh, a senior Republican senator. And that hyperpartisanship just started, just started, as I said, with Newt Gingrich. And his name is Alan Simpson. And Alan and I, uh, it got so partisan there. I mean, we're talking about the, the late 1990s that Alan and I had to sneak out to have lunch together because <laughs> uh, his staff told him, you know, don't be seen with that that labor secretary, and my staff told me, don't be seen with Alan Simpson. And so it was like going, you know, like having a little affair. We had to just, <laughs> uh, but these days it's much, much worse. These days uh, you don't even have the staff or the, even the summer interns talking to each other across the aisle. Uh, I tell my students, and this is something that I think we should tell each other, and I try to remind myself all the, all the time, the best way of learning is to talk to people who disagree with you. Because it forces us to sharpen our arguments, to rethink where we are, to make sure that we, our assumptions are right. Uh, given how easy it is to surround ourselves just with people who agree with us, uh, to go on the internet and have just the algorithm respond in a way that only we see things that confirm our biases, how easy does, is it for us to pretend or forget that there are other points of view and that po possibly they are correct? And what is true? It is not this simple. But what is true is that when, this is a Brene Brown quote, it is harder to hate up close. Mm. And <laughs> what we know is that three quarters of white Americans say they don't have any non-white friends. 53% of Americans say they don't know anyone who's Muslim. Most strong Hillary supporters during the election didn't know a Trump supporter. Most strong Trump supporters didn't know any Hillary supporters. We have, our schools are more segregated now than they were 20 years ago. Our neighborhoods, our communities are segregated. Again, that's because of policy, economically segregated, right? Mm -hmm. Not, but that's because of policy, that's because of history, that's because of, and it's also because of the choices we make as well as individuals. So. Um, there is that piece of making an effort to get out of our bubbles, to know each other. We know that the uh, polar and nasty and sensational uh, drives out the informed and intelligent. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I don't see that happening on the natural. I would encourage you, however, to continue your your uh, uh, your your 
outreach, your debates, your fora, your invitations to candidates and uh, people knowledgeable in an area uh, so that public discourse can be informed by what is uh, available in the fact as opposed to an opinion uh, setting. Uh, but the members of the club, or again, possibly the club itself, might get behind a few other reforms. I've, Great. I've felt that the the independent movement needs needs uh, help and could have it in California. Mm -hmm. um, for example, it's presently the ruling under the California electoral law that no one may put the word independent after their name on the mm -hmm. ballot. Mm -hmm. So if you are not a member of the two parties, and the two parties are increasingly polarized, you have to have no party preference, which mm -hmm. sounds as though you don't care. It's almost mm -hmm. a, uh, a, a an attribute of, of tuning out. Uh, mm -hmm. This could easily be changed. The Secretary of State has already issued an opinion that he will not uh, change it. And uh, the premise is an interesting one. As you might know, uh, when George Wallace ran for president, he created the American Independent Party. Uh, and yes. because that party still exists, the Secretary of State of California has ruled that no one may put the word independent after their name because mm -hmm. of voter confusion. Sure. Um, I, I doubt really that there is voter confusion, but uh, we have that uh, ruling. So that could be changed by, by statute. Another mm -hmm. change, and, and obviously as an independent, it rises in possibility along with campaign contribution or campaign uh, expenditure limits if we're able ever to get them. You have a you have a natural drive towards compromise and towards the middle. You're talking about no one and discover that we have a whole lot in common that really has nothing to do with this difference that's presently dividing us. Is that what you right. mean? But without it being like reductivist, you know what I mean? Without being like, oh, let's ignore the differences. Let's pretend we're all the same. Let's kumbaya. Let's all come together. Let's like, right? This isn't yeah. conciliatory. It's not weak. It's not mushy. It's, it's an and, right? It's... I can have my deeply held beliefs, right? I can, I mean, literally I argue about politics for a reason. I'm not talking about dropping your views or beliefs anytime soon. I can argue firmly and passionately for my beliefs without attacking, demeaning, dehumanizing, and destroying people who disagree with me. I know that James and Deborah Fallows are going to be uh, presenting mm -hmm. to the club in the next few days. Right. Um, for those of you who haven't read the piece yet. For those of your members who have not yet read the piece, the Fellows wrote a tremendous article for this month's Atlantic magazine. And one of the things they do is they talk about community-based, solution-based mm -hmm. mm -hmm. problem solving. Great. And I think one of the things that comes out of the article is that it's something that's easier to do in a smaller community mm -hmm. than in a larger one. Mm -hmm. Well, most large communities don't have an asset like the Commonwealth Club. And it might be easier to do in a small town where everybody knows together and their kids all play on the same soccer team. But even in a big me megalopolis, is that the word? Well, certainly the Bay Area yeah. is a megalopolis. Well, it's, it's more challenging here. Sure. But again, that's what the Commonwealth Club does. So if you could pick one or two things that you would recommend the club do to help improve the state of civic participation, public dialogue here and around the country, what would the club do? Well, as we've been talking about, I think promoting examples of not just bipartisanship, but for lack of a better term, cross-ideological cooperation, I think is a tremendous service that the club has always provided, but is now needed more than ever. You know, and in a deep blue region of a deep blue state. Traditional forms of bipartisanship you know, become a different type of challenge. Mm -hmm. um, but there were plenty of disagreements, even on one side of the political sure. aisle. Sure. You and I were talking a little bit earlier about the debate going on on college campuses mm -hmm. over free speech. Right. And while it sometimes it becomes a progressive versus conservative argument, more fundamental questions of freedom of speech mm -hmm. versus identity these are the kind of conversations that have to take place in a forum right. that doesn't require police protection. Right. And once again, that's what the Commonwealth Club does. Right. There was a wonderful speech that former President Clinton gave um, after, ugh, maybe after Sandy Hook, after Orlando, tragically, mm -hmm. it's hard to separate mm -hmm. 
those tragedies from each other. But he's talking to a Democratic National Committee uh, gathering, and he said, I'm with you on guns, you know that. Mm -hmm. He said, on assault weapons, on background checks, right down mm -hmm. the line, I'm with mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. He said, here's our problem. He said, I have a lot of friends, I know a lot of really good people in Arkansas who don't agree with us on these issues. Mm -hmm. And he said, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, he said, our problem is that they think that we think that they're stupid. Mm -hmm. And he said, I've been able to convince a lot of people of a lot of things over the years, but starting out that process by telling someone that they're stupid or that they're not as smart as me is probably not the best way to do sure. it. And both blue and red and left and mm -hmm. right, these conversations require, I think, a certain amount of humility in order to say there are certain things on which we're never going to convince each other. Right. But let's find those where there is some opportunity for common ground and try to have a civil conversation. What do we lose in our society when, in fact, there is no place for a fiscal conservative and social moderate or when compromise is uh, de-incentivized by the way the system is set up. What do we lose in functionality of our democratic system with a small d, democratic? Right, right. Very good question. Uh, you, you lop off the middle of the distribution curve. So let's assume that a series of possible answers to any public policy issue are distributed across a, 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 a scope of possible answers. There's a left extreme and there's the right extreme. Uh, you lop off the middle, and if it's a bell-shaped curve, it, it, the, the chances are that the middle comprises a much higher percentage of the populace. You then alienate um, that middle from participating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so as you know, I left the Republican Party after the Republican Party uh, refused to reconsider its nominee for president, and that followed the then-candidate uh, Donald Trump's uh, statement that the Second Amendment folks might do something to prevent a President Hillary Clinton. The kind of dialogue that takes place at the club is needed more than ever. And I think we've been in a gradual decline over quite a number of years towards a point where there's more polarization and less understanding and less willingness to understand uh, the other party. I think there are many reasons for it. I think the uh, uh, use of social media has been a major influence because in the social media, the ability to uh, characterize the other in a few words or in a one-way conversation uh, violates a lot of the, the settings of dialogue which characterized society uh, in the past. And as we reduce the number of words to 140 characters, uh, that kind of polarization and uh, characterization becomes even worse. The kind of dialogue and taking time to listen and think, which is the hallmark of the club, is absolutely critical to begin to reverse this tide. And I think that level of, of personal respect and regard, like we talked about earlier, doesn't guarantee policy agreement, but at least it creates the conditions where it can exist. Because right. if you're screaming and yelling and insulting someone, they're probably not going to listen to a policy compromise from you. I think it's an exciting opportunity in the ability to have these conversations across, across great geographic and ideological uh, distances mm -hmm. is, a, is a really neat one. There's an old quote, well, I guess I'll, any quote from Ronald Reagan is an old quote now. Ronald Reagan once said, someone who disagrees with me 20% of the time is not my enemy. Right means he agrees with me 80% of yeah, the time, which means right. he's my friend and ally. And the coda on that that I offer to my students at Cal and at SC is I said, somebody who disagrees with me 80%, somebody who disagrees with me 80% of the time isn't my enemy either. Mm. She's someone I can work with 20% of the time. That's right. It's just a little bit harder and takes a little bit more time to figure out what that 20% mm -hmm, is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if the Commonwealth Club of San Francisco and, yeah, and I'm making this up, the Rotary of Dallas mm -hmm. don't agree on many things. Mm -hmm. There's probably a few, and those few things can really lead to some meaningful progress. Well, I, I just think that the, the conservative tradition at its best is a noble tradition and a necessary one in the country. Um, listen, I'm a liberal, I'm on the left side of Pluto, I'm proud of it, but you don't want me running your government by myself. 
uh, you will be broke, <laughs> uh, overregulated. <laughs> um, you know, because you need that push and pull with the conservatives. You know, the conservatives always ask questions, you know, like, how much does this cost and who's going to pay for it? You know, I never asked that. <laughs> I, 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 I said, you know, feed the babies, you know, God, help everybody. So, you know, you need that back and forth to come up with smart stuff. You know, you know that from college, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, right? That's, you know, I'm for government, you're for markets. We fight long enough constructively, we'll come up with a public-private partnership that's better than your idea or my idea. That's how it's supposed to work. We've gotten so far away from that. We just do thesis, antithesis, thesis, antithesis, and then we go to commercial. And, <laughs> and try to sell you medicine that sounds like it's going to kill you. So, <laughs> I don't think this is working. I think the Commonwealth Club's principles uh, that it uh, has as core values are absolutely central to a functioning democratic society and democratic government. Uh, the notion of having a positive regard for others, uh, being willing to listen, uh, being willing to engage in the other's ideas, which is the fundamental premise of the the Commonwealth Club uh, is absolutely essential. But what you've got to combine with that is a belief in compromise itself and a belief that everything you're doing is working for the common good. Without those elements, uh, it seems to me to be impossible to have a functioning society that makes progress. And you add to that the fourth club principle of validated information, truth, uh, it seems to me uh, that is also essential to making progress. So I think the club's been on the right track from its very start, a hundred or so years ago, but it's all the more important today. Is it more difficult today to cross political boundaries, and why? Uh, it is. Uh, the electronic media has made it so. Uh, when I first ran for Congress in 1988, uh, in order to be on television, one would have to buy the major networks in the entire Bay Area, and that was prohibitively expensive. You would hit seven or eight people for every one in your district. Uh, now, with the ability to target uh, the cable TV, uh, car, you can target by district, and you can also target by uh, political inclination. MSNBC will get you the Democrats, and Fox will get you the Republicans. Uh, so what you have now is much more available uh, electronic media for the for the partisan attack. Um, uh -huh. Social me social media does that too. Uh, with the advent of of, uh, of social media, we have the ability to do the attack, including some of the uh, potentially illegal activities that have occurred. Uh, so I would say the electronic development of the last 15 years and uh, accelerated in the last five has made every incumbent vulnerable to a to an attack within his or her own primary, uh, thus driving the incumbents to the polar uh, edge instead of towards the center. So to that point that no one is the worst thing they've done in life, I also hope no one is the worst thing they've thought in life, the worst thing they've believed in life. No one also is just who they voted for in 2016 or just who they voted for in 2008. I really hope we are all not just that. Mm -hmm. And there is a way in which our culture, our media, our politics right now, it, it aggravates, incentivizes, profits off of intense division, acrimony, extreme views, and it reduces us to the things we are most divided on. As I said, we're, we wanted to talk about the role of the Commonwealth Club and uh, its programming and, and what we can do in a time of polarization of views and, and uh, Kind of sclerotic politics. Um, and let's start with kind of the bigger question of um, how essential are the club's core concepts of, you know, civil discussion and respect for others in a time like this? Well, you know, one of the reasons why I'm so honored to be uh, part of the Commonwealth Club is because of its long history mm -hmm. uh, and, and the place that it has, has, has and the job that served. Uh, in the community uh, and in California for so many decades. Um, you know, we've had a coarseness in civil, uh, uh, in civil life for 
too long, decades. Uh, and, you know, we now find ourselves um, barraged every day uh, with an avalanche of uh, lies and uh, distortions and, um, you know, just unfortunate circumstances coming right out of the White House, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, I, I hear the press now saying it and I keep thinking, well, it's been 15 months. Welcome to the party. Um, but, you know, I think we have to uh, stand for our principles. And that's what the Commonwealth Club does. It reminds us that there's a safe haven. Uh, in the end, conversations should be about uh, ideas, ideals, not ideology. And if you want to hear what someone else says, then you have to be willing to listen. You cannot be listening if you set up a hostile environment uh, where you put someone um, in defense or on edge or make them feel as if uh, you're really there to berate them uh, and worse, um, castigate them. So, you know, I think that what we've done here for many, many, many years is a welcome refuge for people. More of it is better. I, I encourage my colleagues on the board to, to come up with ways to broaden our effect, to uh, remind people that uh, this is the standard that we're meant to have. Um, too often now, everything has been normalized and dumbed down. Uh, we're hit with so much, so much every day. Uh, we wake up, America dawns, and they're hit by tweets in the head, things that you can't believe, uh, and then it goes on during the day. And so I think people have um, forearmed themselves, steeled themselves, and uh, that won't work either. So we need to have a place where, like the Commonwealth Club, more of the Commonwealth Club, and remind people how important it is that you cannot have a civil society that works for everyone without being civil. You, you mentioned the, the, what's going on with the White House right now. Do you think any of these problems existed or were getting worse before the current administration came in? I mean, were these pre-existing trends in the United States? Yeah, you know, I look back, um, you know, I remember uh, when I went to Congress in 1996, the day I got sworn in in January of 1997, uh, Newt Gingrich was the speaker. He was hit with a $300,000 fine. We were called, our families were in the gallery. We were called to be sworn in at around noon, and we sat there till about 2 o'clock because the deal that Newt Gingrich had made to be censured and fined at three, for $300,000, which was a historic fine for a speaker, a sitting speaker, he attempted to negotiate that morning and hold one of my Democratic colleagues hostage. And, um, you know, not that he should get the credit for anything, but I give all the credit for this to, to Newt Gingrich because, you know, in the 80s when he decided that he wanted to leave uh, a small college in Georgia and go to Congress, uh, you know, he is a smart man. He is very articulate. His, his theory of the case was that he had to tear down the Congress and that he had to tear down the people in his own party so that he could emerge as the leader and that Republicans had to be tougher. Mm -hmm. And that meant that this had to become a blood sport and that it had to become the politics of personal destruction. He went after someone that I, I knew. Um, my former husband grew up in Peoria, Illinois. His congressman was a guy named Bob Michael. Bob Michael's son, Scott, and my former husband went to college together at Yale. So I've known the Michaels for a very long time. What people don't know is in those pictures that you see, Ronald Reagan, Tip O'Neill, the stories about you know, Ronald Reagan or Tip O'Neill calling each other to have a dram of whiskey and talk about things and get things done, there was always a third person in the picture. Because Tip O'Neill would never go to the White House without Bob Michael. Yeah. But Bob Michael was considered feckless because he was in the minority and he went along. And that could not be, you know, Newt Gingrich couldn't have that. So it began this attack on people in public service, the attack on people that went Washington. So if you were married and had a family and you decided that the commute was something that was going to, you know, really hurt your family time, you moved your family to Washington. Lots of people did that. It didn't mean that you left your community. Members came home all the time. But it meant that you had a priority of your family and your job, and you found a way to work it out. Newt Gingrich attacked those people. He attacked Bob Michael. 
And eventually he deposed Bob Michael and became the leader of the Republican Party and marched his way right to the majority and then marched his way right off the cliff when his own, when his own party got rid of him because he was so caustic. So it's been 30 years, 35 years, but we find ourselves now with people denigrating public service. You've got a president now that denigrates people that are in law enforcement, in the FBI, in our intel community. Um, you know, this is not the way to have anybody choose to go into public service. And that's why we have, I think, in many cases, the wrong people in Congress. It, it, so are you saying what's happening now is normal? No, because here, here's the other difference between now and then. And here's the part that is really new. Um, in 1965, when the president was, had all of these incredible powers, it was all, Congress at that time was way more independent of the president, even if Congress and the president happened to share the same party affiliation. Jimmy Carter had a Democratic Congress through all four years. Bill Clinton had a Democratic Congress for his first two years. And yet in both cases, Congress did open sight, stop things the president wanted to do. Um, in, Jimmy Carter was made by a Democratic Congress by pressure from them to sell his peanut farm. That was not Republicans who made him do that. They, did, they, didn't have, they were mi in the minority in both houses. It was Democrats who said, you know, and I, we now regard this as a joke, but it was quite a substantial farm and it, was, it was, could have received agricultural subsidies and Congress said that you have to sell it uh, or divest yourself to other family members. Uh, what has happened now is at the same time as we are breaking the post-Watergate ethical restraints on the presidency, we're also seeing a new hyper-partisan unity between Congress and the president where the old idea dating to the early days of the Republic that ambition would balance ambition, that Congress would be one thing and the presidency would be a different thing. We have seen checks and balances. Here, the checks and balances, are, which are a metaphor, not a law, they're not checking because Congress is acting not as an independent body, but as fellow Republicans who are trying to pass a common agenda and need to protect and empower a president of the same party. So the role of the Commonwealth Club would be to popularize these alternatives, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. let it be understood what their benefits are. And then if citizen groups want to put together an initiative, because I fear the, 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 those in power are not likely to change the mechanisms that brought them into power, mm -hmm. but the, the initiative process would be available um, after being well informed. If, for example, the Commonwealth Club Symposium on uh, means of ending polarization or minimizing polarization. You, you would have instant uh, runoff. Um, you could have the use of the word independent. Um, mm -hmm. You could have um, third party. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been active in creating a third party. I have not yet mm -hmm. launched it. Mm -hmm. um, but my view is that, it, it, I put the proposition to you and your members, it is absurd that in order to be a good Republican, I have to be uh, anti-choice. Um, yeah. Why can't I be pro-choice and for balancing the budget? Mm -hmm. um, and in order to be a good Democrat, I have to be against school choice. I have to be with mm -hmm. the Eastern Union. Why can't I be in favor of school choice and uh, vigorous efforts to protect the environment? Uh, the, the odd coalition of issues or coalescing of issues within the two major parties uh, creates uh, awkward uh, mm -hmm. identifications. So where does a fiscal conservative, social moderate uh, go? Yeah. Um, the two parties don't make the, um, such, a, such a person welcome. Um, and so the more we can do to create vehicles for people to have an independent voice, and that's why I'm thinking a, a third party might actually uh, be such a vehicle, the better. That both of us need to reach far enough back into our own respective histories in order to find those examples. They still exist in American politics, mm -hmm. but they're a lot harder to find. Mm -hmm. And once again, to me, that's just such a tremendous value of what the Commonwealth Club does, mm -hmm. is searching those examples out and highlighting them so that people know that it still exists. You know, that's a very interesting idea. Is that something you'd like to see the Commonwealth Club do more of? Perhaps shine a light on examples of across the aisle collaboration? I think that's exactly right. I mean, it's, first of all, it's, it's what, you, what you already do so, so well. Mm -hmm. And because those examples are more difficult to find for the average citizen than they once were, I think the club could provide a tremendous service mm -hmm. by identifying those examples, not only here in the Bay Area, but more broadly, and providing them a platform. So for someone, 
from this community who wants to find a way to create a partnership across mm -hmm. traditional ideological mm -hmm. boundaries, mm -hmm. they can come here or go online and see an example of it happening rather than trying to figure it out for themselves. In your fondest wishes, where would you like to see collaboration? Can you name two or three societal issues where you would like to see collaboration? Who would be collaborating? Just, just kind of your, your wildest dreams. Oh my goodness, my wildest public policy dreams. Um, that's almost an oxymoron, wild public policy that's dreams. That's true. But I think yeah, if, if you look at the issue, you, you could pick any issue. Um, but for me at least, um, I look at public education. Mm -hmm. um, not only K-12 or K-14, but higher ed as mm -hmm. well. And in particular, the changing nature of workforce preparation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And look, we've been having fights for many years over charter schools and merit pay and that sort of thing. And these are critical issues, mm -hmm. and we need to continue those discussions. But there's a great saying from, uh, of all people, from Dwight Eisenhower. He says, if you can't solve a problem, enlarge it. Mm -hmm. And if we begin thinking about education, not just in terms of these very specific public policy red lines, mm -hmm. but rather more broadly about what it takes to prepare young people, to become contributing members of a changing workforce, mm -hmm. and to become contributing members of a changing society and mm -hmm. democracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that's not the kind of conversation by broadening it, that people who might agree or disagree on charters or teacher hiring or abortion rights or marriage mm -hmm. equality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. might be able to have a good conversation about what it takes to prepare mm -hmm. the next generation mm -hmm. of citizens mm -hmm. for those responsibilities. I think the club has got to double down on its commitment to dialogue, on its commitment to taking enough time in these events so that one can listen to the perspectives being presented. I think the club ought to double down on its commitment to invite people from the right and the left and the middle who will talk in terms of uh, how we reach compromise and who will be committed to a fact-based dialogue that doesn't involve the hurling of anathemas against one another uh, without much thought. If, if this is largely media driven, what can be done about that? Um, I think that there are roles to be played by groups like the Commonwealth Club in serving a, a um, guardian function, a watchdog function. Um, I've got a couple of ideas that you might want to consider at your board meeting. Um, among them would be if you want to collaborate possibly with the Markala Center. Do you know about yeah, that? Yeah. The, one, one, of, one of the other people recording for this uh, video is Kirk Hansen. Oh, great. Well, Kirk's a great guy and an old friend. So maybe a, a joint venture and maybe League of Women Voters. Uh, I'm thinking of a possible uh, guardian role where a candidate would pledge to abide by the Standards that the Markala Center has put out. I, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if you've seen them, but they're they're quite solid in terms mm -hmm. of how she or he will behave during a campaign, including uh, coordinating expenditures or tolerating groups that uh, do the attack for you. Um, and in other words, not tolerating groups to do an attack for you. And then a group like the Commonwealth Club, and specifically the Commonwealth Club, because of your prestige. Uh, and your ability to speak with a nonpartisan voice might be in a position to monitor and uh, call to account uh, those who have departed from, for the sake of example, the Markala standards. Um, I was thinking something along the lines of a good housekeeping seal of approval, uh, which with uh, effort could become the standard so that if an advertisement or a, an, a, uh, a Facebook uh, message uh, appears uh, and does not have it, uh, viewers would be on notice uh, that this is uh, something to be uh, discredited. I think the club's principles are under fire today. And I think, unfortunately, we have to um, be brave in our expression of the commitments of the club to the kind of respectful dialogue that has been our culture for the last hundred years. I think we have to continually press against the kind of attitude which says you can hurl 
accusations against one another, characterize the other's position in unfair ways. Uh, it's time for us to become a bit countercultural, uh, and the club uh, should revel in being able to do that, uh, in being able to uh, uh, be a force uh, against the kind of tendencies that unfortunately have been unleashed in our society. Uh, the values that we hold are under fire today, but there are plenty of people who believe in what we believe, who believe in the kind of respectful dialogue. But we will still be perceived as countercultural, will be perceived as going against the grain. Uh, people will criticize us on the same social media uh, that they criticize each other. Uh, but we've got to pay that price. We've got to continue to move forward and model the kind of dialogue which eventually will lead us out of this very strained period. I'm optimistic. I hope and I believe that the club can play a very important role as the whole society makes a recommitment to reasoned dialogue, fact-based dialogue, respectful dialogue, and uh, a culture of listening carefully to each other. We have so many innovative people working at the Commonwealth Club. Uh, everywhere, including in programming. Um, but I would, I would say that if uh, I was able to come today, and I'm, I'm sorry I can't, um, I would say that part of what we need to do is remind people that uh, we are not only an ideal of a place for civil discourse, but we are a physical place. But in, 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 a, in a time of digita di digital world and you know, everything being in the ether. Um, you don't necessarily even have to be here to, to, to be part of things, but that we're always gonna stand for our values. But as much as we can open ourselves up as a fora, multi-dimensionally, so that more people can participate and people can come either physically or not and participate and uh, hear what we're doing and see what we're doing, uh, I think the better off our community will be. Um, you know, we're kind of here in the free state of California, so to a certain extent, we're not oblivious to what's going on. We are certainly under attack by this government in Washington, but you know, we, we have a different set of priorities and values, but we're not immune. And what's going on in Washington is hurting us. Uh, you know, whatever Scott Pruitt's doing to the EPA to take all the innards out of it uh, is gonna hurt us because we value clean air and clean water and all of the other things. So I think it's important that the Commonwealth Club do everything it can to open the aperture to create for us, whether they are physical or in the ether, uh, for, for people to have civil discourse, exchange ideas without ideology, and welcome, um, welcome change and help institute change. Final question. When you look across the country today, are there others, in, leaders, individuals, groups, organizations, even government agencies that uh, you see doing a good job of uh, responding to, you know, the, the incivility with civility and, and trying to address the polarization? Well, um, I was just in, uh, in uh, New York the other day uh, and uh, Hillary's uh, group Onward Together had a group of people. So all of these young people that have created these uh, very new uh, kind of community outreach organizations. Um, a lot of them are political, but they're not just political. They, but they are meant to bridge what they consider to be the old model of the parties and joining a party uh, to more of a community activism. Things that could be for um, ballot measures, things that could be for making sure uh, that if you need more crossing guards or street lights, or if you wanna have pass a bond measure for, uh, for a municipal transit, or higher up if you wanna do something in the state. Um, and so there's groups like Indivisible, Run for Something, uh, Voto Latino, um, Emerge America. You know, those are just four groups, Swing Left. I mean, those, those, are, those are the idea factories for what we want. What we've had too long is a sense of complacency. People said, uh, you know, I, I don't like that. They yell at each other. I'm not going to pay attention. Well, when you don't vote, you're giving somebody else the government that they want. 
It's very rare that you get the government that you want and certainly not the government that you need. So more is better. So these, I love these groups. These young people are so innovative and clever and they're out there working in communities, giving people information and saying, don't sit on the sidelines. You sit on the sidelines, people are gonna pass you by and you're not gonna get what you need unless you have a voice at the table. You know, it's that old thing, if you're not, if you're not sitting at the table, your, your lunch. So, you know, I think that some of those groups uh, are going to survive the 18 election. Mm -hmm. uh, they are big movements. I think it's important for people to know about them. And I think it's important for people to support them. You sound optimistic about the next generation, the next generations. Um, do you think they will change the policies and, and the, 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 the environment that we're, we're doing our politics in today when they get into holding office and, and yeah. running? I have, my daughter's 27 and I am betting on the future. I think we do need to learn from the children because what the children after the killing in Florida, they are the ones that went out and marched um, and we need to support them. <laughs> And by the way, I do think there needs to be a really uh, important relationship between the millennials and those of us that don't like to be called old, so I call us perennials, uh, and that we need to have that relationship. But let me summarize by saying that I am optimistic. Now, that may surprise you, but I am optimistic. I'm optimistic for a number of reasons. I'm optimistic, number one, for the very reason I started out with. It is when we are losing something that people recognize its value. I have never heard in recent years so many people tell me how valuable our democracy is, how much they're going to fight for it, how concerned they are about it, and how they understand that as Citizens, their responsibility is not just to vote or be on juries and to pay their taxes. Their responsibility is to be involved. I have not heard that much from people about engagement and involvement since the anti-Vietnam War years of the late 60s. I'm also encouraged because I look at my students. And I have never seen, I've been teaching since, well, since the beginning of the, of the 1980s, I have not come across a generation of students, of young people that are as committed, as engaged, as dedicated, as idealistic, as determined to change the direction of this country for the better as this generation of young people. including high school people, those kids in Florida. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And I'm also encouraged because so many people are so determined to save our democracy. These are trying times for many of us. I don't know how your blood pressure is. I try to distract myself every day. I go on little vacations. I try not to get burnt out. But I just want to tell you that your engagement and involvement is critically, critically important. In the first place, do you agree with Walter Ruther, who spoke before the club last Friday, when he said that all the conservatives should be placed in one party and all of the liberals in another. I'll take that one, take that one first. Right. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I may I say that I agree with Mr. Ruther on some things, but I disagree with him on many more things, and on this I very emphatically disagree with him. I think it would be a great tragedy in the United States if we had our two major political parties uh, divide on what we would call a conservative liberal line. Uh, I know the suggestion has often been made that what ought to be done is that the Republican Party, for example, should uh, uh, make common cause with the more conservative Democrats of the South and form a new party, which would be called the Conservative Party, and that then all of those who support 
what Mr. Ruther would call the labor point of view, would be in another party. Now, why don't I think this would be a good thing? Because I think one of the attributes of our political system has been that we have avoided, generally, violent swings in administrations from one extreme to another. And the reason we have avoided that is that in both parties there has been room for a broad spectrum of opinion. Now it is true that the Republican Party generally, as far as its economic philosophy is concerned, is more conservative than the Democratic Party today. The center of ideology in the Republican Party is further to the right. The center of ideology of the Democratic Party is further to the left. But in the Democratic Party, there are some who are more conservative than men like Mr. Ruther, who is one of the leading figures in the Democratic Party. And in the Republican Party, there are some people who are more liberal, for example, than Senator Goldwater, who is considered to be one of the more conservative Republicans. I think this is good. I think it is good because by having this room in both parties for a broad spectrum of views, it means that when your administrations come to power, they then will represent the whole people rather than just one segment of the people.